Welcome, everybody. Um, yesterday, you had a little bit of a basic introduction. James uh, talked um, about sequencing technologies and gave some of the kind of um, uh, basic information about how it works. Today, we're going to get into more detail. We're also going to talk about specifically what the um, differences are when working with ancient DNA, what some of the challenges are. So everybody here is interested in working in ancient metagenomics to work with metagenomic data from old or degraded DNA. And today we're going to focus specifically on some of the problems that we face when trying to work with uh, genetic material that is old and degraded. All right. So first, I wanted to give a little bit of a background of the field for those of you who are not very familiar with it. The field of ancient DNA research begins in 1984 with this publication right here by Russell Higuchi and colleagues out of Alan Wilson's lab. And what they did is they had worked with a museum to analyze some muscle tissue from this animal here called the quagga, um, which had recently gone extinct. It's a member of the equus family. As you can see, it's kind of related to zebras, kind of related to horses. And the idea here is, could they um, could they reconstruct the DNA from from this ancient extinct animal that it had gone extinct in the 19th century? So this is a photograph from a zoo, one of the last photographs taken of the quagga. Now, the work that they did, this is the sum total of sequencing data that was published in the paper. There is no supplementary information. There is no gen bank. There's nothing. This is all of the data they generated. It fits in one figure. Um, but we have to keep in mind that at this time, generating this kind of sequencing data was completely new. And this is really before the revolution in digital technology. Today, it is hard to imagine a world where things are not digital, but that was true in 1984. It was essentially a completely analog process. Just to put this into perspective, one of the most widespread and at this point somewhat dated and old-fashioned uh, digital um, technologies we use to just create something as simple as a spreadsheet, Microsoft Excel, wasn't released to the public until 1985. So prior to this, all of this was done by hand on paper and there was very little um, digital technology at all in use. How did they sequence this DNA? Well, they used a technique that had only very recently become available just seven years before in 1977. In the paper, they state that quagga DNA sequences were sequenced via the prime synthesis dideoxynucleoside chain termination method of Sanger, which today we refer to as the Sanger method. This is the original paper by um, Fred Sanger and colleagues uh, where they published uh, the first truly successful method for sequencing DNA, when you think about it, DNA is extremely tiny. It is extremely low abundance. It's a chemical. How do you actually get the sequence of nucleotides in something like DNA? They worked this out using biochemistry, and they were the first to really produce a sequencing technology that allowed us to look at the order of bases within a genome. How they did this, as I mentioned before, was a completely analog process. It involved uh, doing a series of uh, reactions that would incorporate different types of nucleotides that um, then could be um, different. At this time, it wasn't even fluorophores. Um, it was using radioactive components that then could be added to, uh, to DNA, um, which would allow you to then visualize it on a gel um, uh, like you see here. And this is from the original Sanger paper. Um, that gel is a little bit messy. In the early days, they had some difficulty over controlling it. This is from a, a couple of years later when the gels improved. But basically what would happen here was you would have to run four separate reactions, one for each base, one for G, one for T, one for A, and one for C, and you would incorporate these different modified nucleotides in different parts of the DNA sequence. And then um, depending on where it incorporated, it would create sequences of different lengths. And then you could run them 
on a gel using gel electrophoresis and they would separate by size. So here, the shortest pieces are at the bottom, the longest ones are at the top. And then you could look at how far each um, molecule group traveled to determine the next base in the sequence. This was literally done with a ruler and a pencil. And I know this because the very first sequences I generated were using this method. That was in 1994. So uh, this was very similar to a gel that I worked with. And what you would do is you would take your ruler here, for example, for this little stretch of DNA that's highlighted at the right. And you'd start at the bottom and you would say, OK, we have a band in the C column. So the first base there is a C. Then you'd move your ruler up. We have two A's and we have two T's. We have another C, a T, a G, a T, and a G. And you would just do this over and over again. The time it took to run the reactions, to incorporate the nucleotides, to run them out onto a gel, and then to get out your pencil and ruler and to um, then write out the sequence would take about a full workday to get a single 100 base pair sequence. And that's if nothing went wrong along the process. As you saw from that previous gel, it was a real art to get a gel to look as crisp and as clear as the one that you see pictured here. In many cases, they were messy and had to be repeated. Now let's contrast this early kind of 1980s, early 1990s method of DNA sequencing to what is possible today. So today, one of the instruments that's become the workhorse of both ancient DNA and modern DNA is the NovaSeq 6000, which is one of the uh, instruments uh, produced by Illumina. And one Illumina NovaSeq 6000 run will generate 10 billion sequences of up to 300 base pairs each with every single run. So you can see here that the scale of data production has changed enormously. Uh, in the early days, almost all of the work involved in ancient DNA research was in the laboratory, getting things like gels to work, getting the nucleotides to incorporate. Uh, it was a lot of biochemistry. Today, the vast majority of work is not in the lab, but is in the bioinformatic analysis. So this is why we're offering a course like this, because this field has so radically transformed that to do this work, yeah, you really have to become proficient in coding and scripting because our problem today is not so much the lab work, which has largely um, become quite standardized at this point, but is this absolute deluge of DNA data that we now have to work with. It is a privilege and it is so exciting to have so much data, but when you have billions of sequences, it requires a very, very a uh, thoughtful uh, strategy for analyzing it or you'll quickly become overwhelmed. All right, so the very first ancient DNA study focused on the quagga, but how did we get to ancient microbes? The focus of this course is not on eukaryotic genomes, but on tiny ancient microbes, and they pose a series of different problems that we'll explore for the rest of the course. But first, let's review where do we get ancient microbial DNA? I mean, let's think about it. You cannot see microbes with the naked eye. And now you're looking not just for microbes, but for ancient microbes. Where are you going to find them? What are the reliable sources of ancient microbial DNA as opposed to all the modern microbial DNA that is all over uh, the world? So for the vast majority of work that is done on I would say ancient microbial DNA, um, we focus on skeletal tissues and also with a strong focus on teeth. Teeth turn out to be a really, really rich source of ancient microbial DNA. So this here depicts a tooth in cross section. Um, and what you can see, I wonder if I can see if I don't, I don't think I have, I'm not sure you can see my cursor. James, can you confirm? Can you see my cursor? Is it invisible? Yes, we, we can see, but you, you can see it. Great. If you press L, you'll get the like, laser pointer thing. Oh, very nice. Okay. So here we have a tooth in cross section. I believe it's an incisor. 
Um, you can see this gray material is the tooth dentin. The black inside is the empty pulp chamber. And the white kind of cap on the top is the enamel crown. We have three different sources of microbial DNA within teeth. The first one here, which is marked in A, is dental calculus. Dental calculus is the calcified uh, dental plaque that forms on the surface of teeth. Um, it is the richest source of ancient DNA that's known in the archaeological record, and it is a dense mat of bacteria that has been essentially fossilized in place by um, precipitating calcium phosphates. It's the only part of your body that routinely fossilizes while you're still alive, and it has some of the best preserved DNA um, associated with uh, skeletal remains. Another really important source of uh, ancient DNA is right here along the walls of the pulp chamber. The pulp chamber of teeth is vascularized while you're alive. It's full of blood and pulp um, that supplies nutrients to your tooth. And because it's connected to your circulatory system, any infections that a person might have uh, at the time of death that are circulating in the blood, um, circulating in the, in the circulatory system, those pathogens will end up also being in the pulp chamber. The tooth itself acts as a kind of protective environment for DNA preservation with all this dentin around it, the enamel cap on top. And of course the tooth itself is sitting within the alveolar bone of the jaw. And so it has many layers of protection. And so what ends up happening is that if you have bloodborne infections, the pathogen DNA from those infections will end up kind of smearing along the borders of this pulp chamber, and they can be recovered later to tell us something about the infections the person had during life. And there's a third source of microbes that are present in teeth, and that is these down here you see in C. And if you look at the tooth, you see all this kind of ragged degradation. So this is what a tooth looks like as it's very slowly decomposing. What happens during life is shortly after a person dies, um, decomposition sets in, uh, various microbes begin to break down the soft tissues. Um, the tooth itself is held in place by something called a periodontal ligament. And And then the bacteria will degrade the pulp and the blood that are in the tooth itself. They'll do this for some time. They have spontaneous remineralization. And because that is um, a disordered process, it tends to form larger crystals, which appear whiter um, in this image here. So all of this kind of white uh, um, uh, kind of uh, dentin that you see here is part of this remineralization process that occurs after those environmental bacteria um, die. And so this is this process that occurs. Down here, which is where this image is from, you can see it's you don't have that white process. These bacteria are still alive and they're still actively degrading the teeth, although very slowly. And you can see them here in this image. These little black dots are each of these living bacterial cells. And you can tell they're alive because they are not mineralized, because they are black. And that means they're still full of organic content. Um, in case you're wondering, these black dots in the picture above are actually not bacteria. Those are little dentin tubules, um, which are little holes through the dentin that allow um, nutrients and other materials to flow through them. Um, and you can see there's a big difference here in the calculus where these bacterial cells all show a certain degree of gray shading or white shading um, that are indicating that they're actually mineralized not only between the cells, but inside the cells as well, literally fossilizing this oral microbiome in place. So these are the three major sources of bacteria that we can recover when we analyze uh, archeological teeth.
Another important source of microbial, ancient microbial DNA is from the skeleton itself. And in particular, if an individual has died of uh, an infectious disease that infects the skeleton. Now, most um, infectious diseases do not. Um, a lot of the infectious diseases that humans have act relatively quickly and do not have time to cause changes to the skeleton because changes in the skeleton occur over very long periods of time. So you have to have a chronic long-term infection to see any kind of alteration of the skeleton. But there are a few diseases that will do this. So for example, tuberculosis is a pulmonary disease. It's a disease of the lungs. However, it tends to be a chronic long-term disease is caused by a microbe called Mycobacterium tuberculosis, whose closest living relatives are actually in soil. It's a very slow growing microbe and it can infect someone over a long period of time. Uh, it can also escape the lungs and if it does so, it typically infects the interior of the ribs or the thoracic vertebra, which directly abut the lungs. So parts of the anatomy that are in very close contact with the lungs. When that happens and uh, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis DNA infects the spinal column here, it can cause lesions to form which weaken the, the vertebra and the weight of the body can then cause the vertebral column to collapse forward like you see here in this example from ancient Peru. This is called kyphosis, this forward collapse of the spine due to the um, weakening of the vertebral bodies from this bacterial infection. This causes this really characteristic hunching um, appearance um, that you may see here, for example, in this bronze from ancient Egypt, um, or for example, in the famous story of the hunchback of Notre Dame, though that hunching is caused by the collapse of the spine due to a tuberculosis uh, long-term infection. Other diseases that will cause changes to the skeleton include things like leprosy, which is also caused by a really closely related bacterium called Mycobacterium leprae. Um, it tends to infect the skeleton in a different way, and it also causes some characteristic changes. It tends to widen the nasal aperture, so you get these very wide openings for the nose, and it tends to break down and destroy the bone of the upper jaw and causing tooth loss, like what you see here. In addition, it causes loss of sensation to the extremities and the progressive loss of fingers and toes um, and the limbs. Um, there's a few other diseases that have uh, also skeletal involvement, things like brucellosis, third stage syphilis, um, but there's rel they're relatively few in, term in comparison to the vast number of infectious diseases that are more acute and fast acting. Um, in addition to skeletal remains, there's also a really rich source of ancient microbial DNA and historic medical specimens. And you see a few examples here. These can include, for example, pathological specimens or organ specimens in jars from 19th century and early 20th century medical collections. Um, these can be valuable sources of historic disease outbreaks or diseases that today maybe are no longer common because of antibiotics. Um, things like... Um, uh, formalin fixed, paraffin embedded tissue specimens can also be very important. For example, we know what we know today about the early evolution of the HIV virus and that it um, can be dated back to at least the 1950s because of these FFPE blocks um, that preserved uh, blood specimens going back to that period. So although the global epidemic did not begin until the 1980s, the virus was already circulating as early as the 1950s. And we know that from looking at these preserved uh, tissue blocks that were really collected for a different purpose, but RNA, for ancient RNA was able to be retrieved from them. And then also there's these really interesting um, historical uh, medical specimens like you see here. This is from a, um, a smallpox vaccination kit. And um, those can be analyzed also to, for example, look at the evolution of smallpox and also the evolution of the vaccine strains that were used to try to inoculate people against smallpox, which was actually a different virus and one that changed through time.
Um, another really interesting and exciting source of ancient microbial DNA is paleofeces. So this is uh, ancient fecal material, sometimes called coprolites. Um, they do not preserve particularly well in the archaeological record. In fact, they're quite rare. Um, but when they do preserve, they can give an incredibly detailed view into the ancient gut microbiome, also ancient diet, and a lot of information about health, things like parasite load um, and uh, other gastrointestinal infections. So uh, the ancient paleofeces is really, really an interesting material. One of the problems though, as you might imagine, is that fecal material degrades very rapidly because it is such a rich source of microbes themselves, feces tends to auto compost in place. There are a couple of contexts in which, however, you can get really good preservation. Um, one is in very dry caves. So for example, in the US Southwest, um, there are many, many dry caves or in Northwest Mexico, for example, many dry caves where the feces desiccates so quickly that you do get good preservation of DNA by removing all of the water from the system, the bacteria are not able to grow. And so you can extend the preservation of the DNA that's originally present in the fecal material. Another good source of uh, paleofeces comes from salt mines. Uh, humans have mined salt since prehistory and the desiccating powers of salt also has a similar effect where if it can remove enough water from the feces, it will also preserve it over a long period of time. So I have a couple of examples here on the right. So this one on the bottom comes from uh, uh, Durango, Mexico. This is from a dry cave um, from a place called uh, near, near uh, Rio Zape. And it uh, has really outstanding preservation um, of the fecal DNA. And that's from a, dry, a kind of dry heat process. And this example here above comes from Austria, from a site called Durnberg. Um, this is from a Celtic mining site, um, a, a salt mine in the Alps. And you can see here really outstanding preservation. You can see even intact whole seeds. And this is also proven to be a really rich source of ancient DNA. When working, however, with paleofeces, you have to be very careful because even when they look well-preserved, the majority of them do not retain an original gut microbiome or fecal signal because of that composting process. So a lot of work has to go into authenticating it and trying to look for um, uh, evidence of decomposition. But when you can find these rare cases where decomposition has really stopped, you can get exquisite information about the past. Another source of ancient microbial DNA, which is very exciting and it's only just recently beginning to be explored, is looking at things like ancient vessels, things like bowls, cups, and plates. Um, I was, I've been involved for a while now in a project in Nepal in the Himalayan mountains um, at a site called Samsung it was on the border between Nepal and Tibet. And it's located along a trade route through the Himalayan mountains in the Kali Gandaki River Valley. What's really nice about this environment is that it's very cold and it's very dry, and that tends to lead to really good preservation. So here, this is from a tomb that's about, about 1,500 years old, and we have things like wooden bowls that are still preserved, bamboo cups. Um, here, I know it might be hard to see, but within the wooden bowl, we still have rice um, that's just desiccated in place. And we have things like just residues that have dried in place and things like this bamboo cup. Uh, we're now working on analyzing some of these residues and have been able to recover really exciting evidence of fermented alcoholic beverages from some of these um, uh, sources. And last, we can also look at sediment DNA. So uh, one of the things that is possible to do is to look at the sediments that have built up within deep caves, for example, and look at the use of the cave's history. Many of these caves served as carnivore dens, and so you have dense deposits of degraded fecal material, urine, decomposing prey, um, all sorts of in, uh, different microbes are present from this buildup 
over thousands uh, or hundreds of thousands of years of occupation of the cave. And in some cases where these caves were occupied by humans or Neanderthals or Denisovans, we can get some idea about their lives. Um, and a lot of work um, is going into this now. Uh, for example, um, uh, Diendo Masolani, for example, has done a lot of work looking at mitochondrial sequences to understand the animal history of these caves, but there's a lot of uh, potential to also go after the microbes. All right. So that's where we can get DNA, ancient DNA from microbes, like where we might find it. But what actually is ancient DNA? This is something that can be confusing to a lot of people, especially when they're coming from outside of the field. So what makes DNA ancient as opposed to just being DNA? So ancient DNA is any DNA from a non-living source that shows evidence of molecular degradation. This is really important because it means that DNA is not defined by its chronological age, but rather by its condition. So it's not defined by a fixed age, but its condition. So, for example, if you're able to retrieve an oral microbiome DNA from the dental calculus of a 100,000-year-old Neanderthal, that's definitely ancient DNA, right? If you get hepatitis B virus from teeth that are 5,000 years old, that would be ancient DNA. If you're getting gut microbiome DNA from paleofeces from a context that's 2,000 years old, that's ancient DNA. 600-year-old plague DNA from skeletons, that's also ancient DNA. Oral bacteria from 19th century gorillas, like you see on the right here, that's also ancient DNA. Pathogen DNA from a 19th century medical specimen and alcohol, that's also ancient DNA. And leprosy DNA, for example, from mid-20th century formalin-fixed paraffin-embedded tissue blocks, that's also ancient DNA. So we've just covered 100,000 years of time here. It's all ancient DNA because all of it exhibits uh, biochemical and molecular changes that degrade the DNA into a condition that makes it ancient DNA. So what are these characteristic changes that occur that make DNA ancient or what we call ancient? We're gonna explore that now in the next half of the lecture. What are the characteristic and predictable changes that will occur? Before we go over that, though, I want to review some genome basics, because depending on what we're studying, how this damage might appear could vary based on the genome structure and nature of the different organisms that we're going to study. So let's just first take a step back and go over some biology 101 here about how genomes differ between different organisms. So first, let's take the virus. Viruses is like this wild west. Viruses can be almost, they have so many different ways that they can organize their genome. So for example, you have DNA viruses and they can be double, excuse me, double-stranded DNA. They can be single-stranded DNA. Their genome can be half double-stranded DNA and half single-stranded. It can have many different combinations. You also have your RNA viruses. Um, you can have a single uh, strand of RNA. You can have many strands of RNA. There's all sorts of different ways that viruses can encode their genome using different nucleic acids in different patterns that are single-stranded, double-stranded, one strand, many strands. Um, and so they're probably the most complex in terms of genomic structure. Next, we have bacterial cells. Um, bacteria will have a single, uh, sometimes people refer to it as a single bacterial chromosome. Technically, chromosome is not correct because chromo and chromosome has to do with whether or not it reacts to certain dyes. But basically, it is a single genome. And importantly, it's circular. So bacterial cells are all circular pieces of DNA. In addition to the main circular genome that bacterial cells have, they can also have plasmids, which are much shorter circles of DNA that they can transfer between cells. So next we're gonna move on to the eukaryotes. Um, and so we're gonna talk about animal cells and plant cells. They have a different organization. 
So within uh, animals and plants, they organize their genome, not just free floating within their cell, but within a certain organelle called a nucleus. Within the animal cell, you have the uh, nuclear genome, meaning the genome that is in the nucleus is organized at, into chromosomes, which unlike bacteria are not circles, but are long strings of DNA. And different uh, animals can have different numbers of strings. You could have one chromosome, you can have five chromosomes, you can have 40 chromosomes. Um, that's just telling you how many different discrete strings of DNA make up that genome. In addition to the nuclear genome inside the nucleus, the animal cells also have mitochondrial genomes. Uh, mitochondria are little organelles that exist within animal cells and they produce the energy for the cell. Mitochondria have their own genomes and their genomes are circular. Um, they're circular because that reflects their bacterial origin in that mitochondria started out as a kind of parasitic bacteria that lived inside these cells, um, but have degraded over time and lost a lot of their genome to the point where they're now uh, have turned into organelles, but re they retain this original um, circular structure to their genome like their bacterial ancestors. Um, this is a really, this kind of story of how this happened is amazing and fascinating and was first really developed by a woman named Lynn Margulis as the endosymbiotic theory of life. And if you're not familiar with it, I encourage you to read about it because it is like one of the most exciting stories in biology. Plant cells are very similar um, in terms of their structure of their genome to animal cells. They also have um, a nuclear genome that is within their uh, nucleus. They also have mitochondria, which have their own mitochondrial genomes. But in addition, they also have a chloroplast, which is a different organelle, which is where they perform photosynthesis. And their chloroplasts also have their own genome called a plastid genome or chloroplast genome. Um, this plastid genome is also circular because it also represents um, an example of uh, a kind of parasitic bacteria that has become entrapped uh, within the cell and has turned into an organelle this happened a you know, billion years ago. Um, and in this case, this chloroplast originates from a type of bacteria called a cyanobacteria, which is a type of photosynthetic bacteria. And it maintains this circular genome um, because of this bacterial origin. Now, one of the things that does differ between animal cells and plant cells is that most animal cells tend to be um, uh, diploid. There are some exceptions, and they can also exist in haploid states, meaning they only have one copy of the chromosome, but most animal cells will have two copies of every chromosome. The number of copies of each chromosome that you have in your nucleus is called ploidy, um, and plant cells are distinct in that they are often polyploid. So they can have two, four, six, eight copies of each chromosome. Um, they have a lot more freedom to increase the size of their genome in that way than animal cells typically do. All right, so let's talk about some relative genome sizes because this is going to have a direct bearing on our ability to reconstruct genomes. Like how big of the problem are we dealing with here? When we try to reconstruct a genome, how much DNA are we really talking about? Viruses have the smallest genomes. So on average, they have their genome size is between 5,000 uh, 5, and 100,000 base pairs long. So five to 100, what we call KBP or thousand base pairs. Bacteria are bigger. Their genomes tend to be between one and five million base pairs long or MBP. Animals have bigger genomes. They tend to be about three to six billion base pairs long or GBP, giga base pairs. And plants on average are larger with about six to 18 billion base pair genomes. However, this is sort of, this is average. This is what's typical, but you have huge exceptions within each of these groups. The largest known viral genome, for example, is Pandora virus Salinas, and its genome is 2.5 megabases, which puts it within the range of bacteria. The largest bacterial genome is Sorangium cell cellulosum, and unfortunately my uh, screen sharing thing is hiding there we go, is uh, 13 megabase pairs long. So this is uh, bigger than most bacteria, 
However, the bacterial genome sizes are quite constrained by the nature of the cell wall and the turgor pressure within it. So they don't get much bigger than about 13 uh, megabases. Hmm. There we go. The largest animal genome is um, uh, from Protopterus ethiopicus, which is a type of lungfish. It's 130 billion bases long. And the largest plant genome is Paris japonica, which is 149 billion bases long. Can you imagine trying to sequence that? That would be very expensive. However, I want to really emphasize that the complexity of the organism and the genome size are not very closely related. So it's not that the more sophisticated a organism is the larger its genome. It does not have that kind of relationship between genome size and organism, or at least not so concretely. Because the organism that, as far as we know, has the largest known genome, although it's a bit controversial because it's quite hard to quantify because it is so large, is actually an amoeba. An amoeba. So Polychaeus dubium um, is currently believed to be the organism with the largest known genome, and it has 670 billion bases for a single-celled organism. All right, but let's get back to humans. Let's talk a little bit about the human genome because that's probably what people are most familiar with. Obviously, it's very uh, important to us being humans. And let's put this into a little bit of perspective. The human genome is 3 billion bases long and we are diploid, which means we have two copies of our genome in uh, most of our cells, with the exception of our sex cells, the eggs and sperm, which only have one copy. So if the genome itself is three billion bases long and you have two copies, that means within each cell you have six billion bases of your nuclear DNA. The chromosomes are arranged into 23 pairs, making a total of 46 chromosomes. And those chromosomes range in length from about 50 to 250 megabases each. And as you can see here, again, they're all strings. They're not circular like we see in prokaryotes. They're arranged as long linear strings. You also have that mitochondrial genome or mitogenome, which is much, much smaller. It is only about 16,500 bases long. However, for each cell, instead of having two copies, you have on average more than a thousand copies. So um, that makes it an interesting target for study. All right. So I always wondered why the chromosomes were named in the order in which they were. And it turns out that the chromosomes, what makes chromosome one, one and 22, 22 has to do with its length. So the longest chromosome in the human genome, chromosome one, was named one because it is the longest chromosome. And so you can look at the different lengths of the chromosome. So chromosome one is about 250 million bases long. Chromosome two is a little bit shorter. Chromosome three is about 200 million bases long and so forth. You'll notice that it's not perfect as you go on. So chromosome 20 is a little bit bigger than 19 and 22 is a little bit bigger than 21. And that's because when the chromosomes were named, genomic te uh, sequencing technologies were not available. And instead they were actually measuring their length by their physical length and karyotypes like you see at the upper right. So let's take a closer look at chromosome one. One of the problems is, is that when a chromosome like this breaks down, it breaks into many small pieces. So when you, um, the process of becoming ancient DNA, you have things like single-stranded breaks, damaged bases, double-stranded breaks, cross-links, and so forth. So that by the time you end up studying it in the form of ancient DNA, you go from what is originally one chromosome into, uh, you break it down into about 5 million pieces. So uh, a typical chromosome one from an ancient DNA context will be broken into about 5 million DNA fragments. That is a very big jigsaw puzzle. So what are the types of damage that occur? So at the left here, we have a model that was first published by Mickey Hofreiter in a study of how DNA decays. And this is based off a large body of work um, by a man named Lindahl who had worked out um, the chemistry of DNA damage in modern DNA. 
And so there's different types of damage that can occur, that can occur including both hydrolytic, meaning water-mediated damage, or oxidative damage. And so the weak points in the DNA are indicated here with arrows. These are all bonds within the ancient DNA molecule that are susceptible to chemical attack. The way that this is organized is, as James pointed out, we have this we have these sugars and this phosphate. So we have this kind of sugar phosphate backbone. And then coming off, we have the different bases like guanine, cytosine, thymine, and adenine. So together, this is a nucleotide. And we have, um, we have here four nucleotides that are shown. Again, and the arrows are pointing to their chemically weak parts. So we now know after a lot of work that although the DNA has many chemically susceptible uh, bonds, um, they some are much more susceptible to damage than others. So in particular, the bond that is the most susceptible to breaking is this one here. It's this bond that connects the guanine and the adenine bases to their respective nucleotides. Does anybody remember what we call these two bases? James, you're going to have to mediate if you're there because I can't see anybody <laughs> while I'm in full screen mode. Does anybody know? What do we call adenine and guanine? You can either post it in the chat. Oops, wait. You can either post it in the chat or come up to the... Okay, people, Lucia and Melinda say purines. Excellent, gold star. Yes, those are purines. So purines are the most vulnerable parts of the DNA molecule, and they are uh, easily uh, broken through hydrolytic attack. And when that happens, you get holes within your DNA molecule where your adenines, some randomly a few of your adenines and guanines will um, be clipped out of your DNA. This opens up these little holes within your double helix. Very good. Once that happens... Um, it makes the sugar phosphate backbone then at these locations also exposed and weak. And at that point, you next get a hydrolytic attack of the backbone. And it breaks this bond here, creating what are called single strand breaks or NICs. These accumulate across the DNA molecule. They rarely happen directly across from each other, right? Because an A and a, and a G are not going to pair with each other. So it creates these nicks along the DNA molecule um, randomly on both sides. As those nicks get closer and closer together, very little it starts to hold the DNA together. As James mentioned before, what's actually holding the middle of the DNA together are hydrogen bonds, which are relatively weak bonds. Between A's and T's, you have two hydrogen bonds, G's. And C's, you have three hydrogen bonds. So GC-rich regions are actually a little bit more strongly held together than others. But you can think of this as like a zipper or like a Velcro here holding these, these, these together. As these NICs get closer and closer together, just the ambient energy present within the system uh, is always shaking the DNA. And if you don't have enough hydrogen bonds holding it together, they will actually melt or peel apart and float away. And that is what happens. If you don't have enough hydrogen bonds between the NICs to hold that DNA together, it will melt off and fall away, leaving you with what are fragments. And this is how DNA fragments into pieces. So in this example here, there are enough hydrogen bonds in this stretch here to still hold the two different sides of the DNA molecule together. But over here, there were not enough hydrogen bonds and the ambient energy in the system led to the melting away of the other parts of the strand. This is what happens um, uh, to ancient DNA. And this is a, a graphic that we produced here. We've looked at dental calculus DNA from bacteria um, from four different uh, sites that date to different time periods. And you can see that our average ancient DNA fragment length is between, let's say, 25 bases and about 150 bases. So this is a typical size of ancient bacterial DNA. It's maybe a little bit on the long side here. Um, but you'll see that the vast majority of DNA we have is around something like the mode is around 60 bases. This is very typical uh, for ancient microbial DNA. So it means that on average, 
our fragments are only about 60 bases because there's at least a single stranded nick about every 60 bases or so um, fragmenting our DNA into smaller and smaller pieces. So this is your typical range of ancient DNA and reflects the closeness of the NICs within that system. So what's happening here is these chemical reactions, this depurination, and then the, the, the breakage of the sugar phosphate backbone, it acts as kind of like scissors that cut up the DNA into small pieces. And um, long genomic DNA, genomic DNA that is millions of bases long, um, this process proceeds pretty rapidly. Once the DNA reaches about um, uh, less than 100 bases, something like 50 bases, it tends to become a bit more stable and will persist at that length for a longer period of time. All right. So after this has occurred, and we have now our DNA fragments that are partially double-stranded and now partially single-stranded, this opens us up for another type of chemical damage, and that is a cytosine deamination. So the next most vulnerable part of the DNA molecule is this amine group on the cytosine here. Uh, once it is no longer hydrogen bonded to a guanine, this becomes a really vulnerable bond. When it is hydrogen bonded, it's actually quite strong and will not break. However, when that hydrogen bond is gone, it becomes vulnerable to water and will be removed. When that happens, it will convert it into a uracil. So a cytosine that's missing its amine group is a uracil, just like what you see in RNA. So this is the next form of damage that occur, accumulates in ancient DNA. So we have high fragmentation, um, and we also have single-stranded overhangs in which uracils will accumulate. Uracils, again, are not normally found in DNA, but are produced through this degradation action of cytosine. That is why when we look to authenticate ancient DNA, one of the things we look for is these characteristic, what are called C to T transitions. The reason that it's a T here is that DNA polymerases actually don't recognize uracil because it's not normally part of DNA. However, instead what they'll do, because uracil and thymine are actually very similar, it will mistake the uracil for a thymine. And so these, when you sequence this DNA, this will be interpreted um, by the sequencer as a thymine. All right, so let's go over the patterns of DNA damage, these predictable patterns. First, we have depurination, and that's the random loss of A and G bases, the purines. Next, we have nicking. This is the hydrolytic attack of the phosphate backbone at sites of depurination. So where we have depurination, we'll get nicking. Next, we have fragmentation. So when two nicks on opposite sides of the strands are close together, the hydrogen bonds between the bases won't be strong enough to hold the strands together, and they separate or melt, causing fragmentation with single-stranded overhangs. And finally, cytosines that are on single-stranded overhangs will undergo hydrolytic attack and lose their amine group, converting them into a uracil. DNA polymerases will then read that uracil as a thymine and introduce C to T errors in downstream sequences. All right, so if you think of our bacterial genome as this nice wine glass here, essentially what time is doing through these processes is fragmenting it into many, many pieces. And our job is to try to put these pieces back together to reconstruct this vision of the past. So in our case, we don't have chromosome one, that's 250 million bases. We don't have a 5 million piece puzzle problem. Because the microbial genomes are smaller, it's more like a 60,000 puzzle problem. So reconstructing an ancient bacterial genome is like putting a 60,000 piece puzzle back together. However, we also have a different challenge than someone who might be trying to reconstruct the human genome. With the human genome, you're pretty much guaranteed that you're only looking at one animal species, right? So all of the animal DNA that you should recover from a human skeletal material should come from the human genome. However, unfortunately, microbes rarely grow in pure colonies in the past. So when we're looking at microbial DNA, we're almost always looking at communities of bacteria. So while any individual bacterial genome is going to be a 60,000 piece puzzle, 
we're going to be looking at hundreds, if not thousands of puzzles all at the same time. Okay, let's review though how this was all figured out because it's an incredible story. How did we go from uh, basically going from completely analog reconstruction of ancient DNA to understanding how it degrades and being able to manipulate this DNA in a powerful way? Tina, sorry, just before we start, you have 20 minutes. Okay, thanks. So in the pre-next generation sequencing era, um, we knew that ancient DNA was fragmented, but the length of that fragments was not known, and it was incredibly hard to measure. Um, short DNA is really easily lost during DNA extraction, so a lot of it was lost during this process, making the, the remaining DNA look artificially longer. Um, and the DNA recovery was so low that you couldn't really see it on a gel. So all of the early literature kind of offers guesses that they think ancient DNA is around 100 to 500 base pairs long, but no one was really able to measure it. In the early day, they used something called polymerase chain reaction to amplify up ancient DNA, and they often tried to target regions that were about 300 to 500 base pairs long, um, but they had a really high DR failure rate and terrible contamination problems. Um, it was known for actually since very early that there seemed to be an excess of C to T transitions and also G to A miscoding lesions in ancient DNA, but it wasn't understood what damage process was causing this. And DNA during this era was pretty much universally seen as a problem that nobody knew how to overcome. Um, during the transition to next generation sequencing, this changed dramatically because NGS no longer required primer sites on the original DNA template, but instead would ligate primer binding sites or adapters onto the ends of the molecule. And for the first time that made it possible to recover all of the DNA in a sample and to measure the true size of ancient DNA. So we didn't actually have the ability to know how long ancient DNA was until the next generation sequencing era. Um, through this, we were able to determine the order of the damage processes by looking at the patterns of degradation and how they accumulated. And then improved extraction methods were then developed that allowed the recovery of very short fragments. And this revealed that ancient DNA is actually much shorter than was ever realized before, with an average length of about 30 to 50 bases. And once all of this was worked out, it was realized that this predictability of DNA damage actually became the solution to authenticating ancient DNA and distinguishing it from modern DNA. So it went from being a problem to an important solution. I'm just gonna review a little bit of the, the order of how this has worked out. So um, some of the really key findings come from this paper from 2007 by Adrian Briggs. Um, and this is one of the earliest applications of next generation sequencing to ancient DNA where they noticed in this graph that you see here, you can see that the green and the black kind of spike up. Um, so you have an increase of purines right before where the DNA molecule starts. So in this graphic here, what you see is the space between zero and zero is the ancient DNA. And the space outside is what would be upstream or downstream of that sequence if you aligned it to a reference genome. And what they found was that there was this pattern that was really consistent where the uh, DNA sequences almost always began right after an adenine or a guanine, so right after one of these purines. They also noticed this C to T transition problem that we have um, at the ends of the molecules. They were much more common at the ends of the molecules and much less common in the middle of the molecules, and that's because they accumulate on these overhangs at the ends of the molecules and they do not occur uh, very often at all on double-stranded DNA in the middle. This plot, because of its shape, was nicknamed the smile plot. All right, so why a smile plot? Why does this happen? It happens because of the randomness of the nicking that causes the overhang. So you start off with all of your DNA, and then through time you generate these many, many fragments. And the way the DNA fragments, as we said, has to do with this nicking, and this nicking is random. So you'll end up with DNA that have different patterns of overhangs. In some cases, both overhangs will be on the same molecule. In some cases, they'll be on different sides of the DNA strand and so forth. So you have many 
dimensions of how the overhangs can. Then the cytosines are able to uh, or DMNA on those overhangs, introducing uh, uracils. And one is that the repair enzymes that we use during blunt end library construction have asymmetric behavior. And that's what creates these characteristic patterns here where, as I said before, everything is a cytosine to thymine transition. Why do we have G to A over here on the end? Why is it not cytosine to thymine over here, but G to A? This has to do with the asymmetric behavior of repair enzymes. So let's go into that. The first thing you have to know to understand this process about DNA is that it has an orientation, a five prime to three prime orientation. Uh, if you remember from your chemistry, when you look at like, for example, sugar molecules, they have a numbering system. So you have, this is the, um, this is the one prime carbon, this is the one prime carbon, two, three, four, five. So this is the five prime end of the DNA molecule. Here you have carbon one, two, three. This is the three prime end of the molecule. So DNA has a five to three uh, prime orientation and they're complementary. So a DNA strand runs five prime to three prime and in the reverse direction, five prime to three prime. We use an enzyme called T4 polymerase to repair the DNA to prepare it for sequencing. This enzyme comes from a bacteriophage called T4. So when we have this DNA damage that accumulates randomly in ancient DNA molecules, and as I said before, sometimes you get the nicks on the same side of the molecule, sometimes on different sides. Um, once you introduce those uracils, you have the fragmentation and you introduce the uracils into the ends, you get a pattern that looks something like this. Okay, so you get a uracil accumulation into the single-stranded overhangs on these different fragments. And here I've gone ahead and put one uracil on every overhang. The first step of converting these ancient DNA fragments into a next generation sequencing library so that it can be read by the instrument and sequenced is you have to repair them to make them fully double-stranded with blunt ends. So it cannot sequence DNA in its native state like this. We have to clean it up a bit. So we have to make it fully double-stranded and make it blunt end with no overhangs. The first thing that T4 polymerase is going to do is it cuts off the three prime overhangs. So it's going to cut off that overhang there, anything on the three prime end. Next, it fills in the five prime overhang. And this introduces a complement where a uracil was before, because as I said, T4 polymerase misinterprets uracils as thymines. Later, when the strands are melted and reoriented into five to five, three prime um, orientation for sequencing, what you'll see is that all the T miscoding lesions are on the five prime end and all the complementary A's are on the three prime end. And this is what produces that characteristic smiley plot pattern. Because damage typically occurs only on single stranded overhangs, the misincorporation rate can actually never reach one. So you'll see up here that in this case, the CDT damage rate is 0.2. In a double-stranded DNA library, like the one we've just shown here, the maximum rate you can ever reach under normal circumstances is 0.5. And I'll let you think about why that might be. And if you have questions, we'll revisit it in the Q&A. So once this pattern was discovered, a number of different tools were developed to be able to quantify this, to use it as an authentication marker. So the first was Map Damage and Map Damage 2, which came out of Ludovic Orlando's group and uh, is one of the real workhorses of looking at DNA damage. Um, uh, PMD Tools was developed by Pontus Skoglin and has been integrated um, to be able to use these particular patterns to, for example, distinguish between authentic and contaminant DNA, particularly in highly contaminated samples. And another tool was developed called Damage, Profile, Damage Profiler, which works very similarly to map damage, but works much, much more quickly. And that's the tool you're going to be using in this course. Um, and so these are the three that we use. As you can see here, this is just looking at runtime. Um, damage profiler is the kind of most computationally efficient. And so that's what we'll be using today or this week in this course. And we can look at these patterns to help us understand if a particular group of sequences are likely to be ancient or not ancient. 
So uh, things that are not ancient will not have these C to T transition patterns on the ends, um, and those that are will. So a typical uh, uh, deamination pattern for a not ancient sample will be completely flat, like this one. Whereas what we want to see is a curve, a smiley plot like this for an ancient sample. Sometimes you'll see things like this. If it's very spiky, that usually means you haven't put enough reads into the analysis to be able to get a clean profile. You need more data. Um, and sometimes you'll see an interesting pattern here where the pattern looks good, but the entire base is elevated. What this means is that you've used the wrong reference genome, um, but something come kind of from a related organism. So everything is, has a baseline a mismatch rate that's elevated, but you can still see that you have an ancient pattern. This is very common for ancient bacteria studies because uh, the reference genomes that are available, for example, in RefSeq, are often insufficient to describe the full diversity that we see in the past. So very frequently, we are forced to use a reference genome that is a close relative, but not the exact uh, species that we are studying. Some people have tried to use uh, DNA damage as a clock, um, but it doesn't work that well. It sort of works, but not really. It's more like a clock that can only say today or a while ago. Uh, here's an example. This is on the left from Ponta Skoglin's work where they showed that, for example, the DNA damage rates were highest in 40,000 year old Neanderthals. And then as you got progressively more recent in time, the damage rate decreased. And so this was really interesting because the older something was, the more damage it had, which leads you to think you can use it as a clock. Here, the Neanderthals, they reach about 45%, uh, 0.45 a damage rate, which, as I said, is very close to the theoretical maximum of 0.5 for a double-stranded library. However, you can see that this doesn't translate to new environments. So this is from a work, another work that was done on, for example, Costa Rica and Mexico, tropical environments, where we know that the heat and humidity combine to speed up these DNA degradation reactions. And in both of these cases, we see that um, this, this uh, DNA is only 1,000 years old, not 40,000 years old. And yet we have right here at the kind of theoretical maximum level uh, of a 50% damage rate. So these are already saturating in Costa Rica. You're already saturating in DNA damage by about 1,000 years ago, whereas in temperate Europe, it takes more than 40,000 years to reach that point. So the relationship between DNA damage, and that's because DNA damage is highly dependent on local temperature and humidity. Also, it can vary by organism, even within the same sample. This is some work that we've done looking at a single sample where you have more than one genome. So for example, this is a herbarium specimen where you have, this is a potato, and this is um, a, a parasite that grows on the potato. And they actually are degrading at relatively the same rate. However, you can also look at a human that's been infected by Yersinia pestis or plague. And you can see that the um, damage that's accumulating in the plague is actually at a much faster rate than in the human. We see that if we look at different uh, oral bacteria and archaea in dental calculus, we see that the damage accumulates faster within bacteria than it does within archaea. Um, and then we can also see that there's really no relationship between the damage accumulation rate in the human DNA versus the archaea DNA. So the different organisms, even within the same sample, can de degrade at different rates, and that may have to do with cell wall structure and other issues. Now, for some applications, you really don't want the damage in there. So it can be really useful for authenticating your DNA, but once you've authenticated it, um, you may really care very strongly about getting a very accurate genotype um, or really accurately characterizing an allele, and that damage can produce uncertainty. And so you may want to remove it for sensitive genotyping or tree building analysis where your base calling accuracy is very important. You can remove damaged cytosines um, with an enzyme cocktail called user, user enzyme. That basically is a mix of uracil DNA glycosylase, or UDG, and something called endonuclease 8. And what this does is the UDG will clip out the uracil base, leaving an abasic site. And then the endonuclease will then clip the DNA backbone back to that abasic site. It effectively shortens the DNA by clipping off all of the damage. And then T4 polymerase will trim the three prime overhang, 
T4 polymerase and fills in the five prime overhang. And now you have a repaired DNA sequence that is shorter than it was before, but no longer contains that damage. So it'll have no damage. You'll get a flat uh, profile like this, and it will be shorter than the original molecule. Sometimes you don't want to remove all of the damage. Maybe you want to remove almost all of the damage to improve your sequence accuracy, but you still want to leave on at least one damage base at the end so that you can authenticate your sequence. So can you have your cake and eat it too? Yes, you can. So this is a technique that was developed by Nadine Rowland in 2015. You can use something called the partial D UDG protocol, or sometimes it's called UDG half. In this case, it will clip off almost all of, it will leave uracil on each side particularly present. So you'll have one uracil left. So your first base will be uh, damaged, but then everything else, you won't have any other damage in your molecule. However, one pattern you may notice is that the damage profile that you have after partial UDG treatment, the frequency of damage on the terminal base is always lower than if you do no treatment. And I'll let you think about why that might be, and we can revisit it in the uh, Q&A. I just want to say quickly, we technically are about to run out of time. Have I just spoken to the R and Python uh, people? You have 15 more minutes, Tina. So we okay, shift the so back a bit. Yeah, we'll shift the break back 15 minutes um, and just have 15 minutes short of the R and Python session. Thanks, James. I'm almost done. Um, I apologize. Um, OK, so let's talk a little bit about single-stranded libraries. So up until now, we've talked double-stranded libraries. That's the most common form of DNA library that's produced. But increasingly, people are turning to single-stranded libraries because they do allow you to often increase your endogenous content. Um, and so there are some advantages. Although single-stranded libraries are harder to generate because they require greater temperature control. All right. So everything we've talked about up until now is valid for double-stranded li libraries, but let's talk about single-stranded libraries. Um, this protocol was developed in 2013. And what's important about it is it does not clip the three prime overhangs. And so you will clip, you will keep all of your original damage. Um, and so when you go to sequence these uh, libraries, all of your original damage is there in place. And so you will have uracils on both sides of your molecule. Um, and so let's do a little damage wrap up here of how your smile plots might look. So this first one, this could be okay if you UDG treat your DNA, but if you didn't, that's not good. And it's an indication that it's a modern DNA sample. If you have a pattern that looks like this, it usually means you have not put enough DNA into the analysis and you don't have the statistical power to generate a proper curve. Um, this is uh, sort of okay. You've got damage on your uh, ancient DNA molecules. That looks pretty nice, but your base is elevated, which means you might want to pick a different reference genome. This one is pretty good. If you did a UDG partial treatment, this is what it should look like. This is what you should get if you did a single-stranded library with your C to T's on both sides. And this is a beautiful uh, smile curve for a typical double-stranded library. All right. I just want to have a little bit of an enzyme alert here, because this is something that often people do times don't know and can introduce uh, problems during the library production step that can really interfere with downstream analysis. As we talked about before, uracil is not a normal component of DNA. And so far, we've discussed how enzymes like T4 polymerase treat uracil like a thymine and introduce these C to T misincorporations. However, not all enzymes do this. Some enzymes, like the fusion group of enzymes, will just stop when they encounter a uracil. So they will just stop amplifying. The damage present in ancient DNA, so the fragmentation and deamination, requires the use of specialized library protocols that are designed for ancient DNA. If you use very effects that will make it extremely difficult to analyze your downstream data or potentially even introduce a lot of contaminant sequences. So it's really important to pay attention to this. DNA polymerases come in two flavors. 
There is one, it's called non-proofreading. A non-proofreading DNA polymerase will treat a uracil like a thymine. A proofreading DNA polymerase will stop at a uracil. For ancient DNA, it is critical to use a non-proofreading enzyme for library construction and the indexing PCR in order to lock in that damage by turning the uracil into the thymine. For later amplifications, you can use a proofreading enzyme, which you might want to do because it has a higher accuracy rate. If you use a proofreading enzyme for your library construction, your, your damaged ancient DNA molecules will not be sequenced, and this will bias your data sets towards contamination. You will disproportionately only build your library DNA. However, UDG-treated ancient DNA is... This comes to two steps, the key steps in which the polymerase encounters the original damaged cytosines. So non-proofreading T4 polymerase for DNA repair, non-proofreading polymerase such as PFU Turbo CX for library indexing amplification, and then subsequent amplifications, reamplifications, and reconditioning steps are all performed using a proofreading enzyme, something like Hercules II. We get lots of questions like this about this in the spam channel where someone accidentally <clears throat> uses a proofreading enzyme for um, the uh, the key steps of indexing and library amplification and then don't understand why they have very strange downstream patterns. This is something you really have to be in touch with your lab about to make sure they're using the proper enzyme. If you want more information about library protocols and enzymes, you can check out our online bench protocols where we uh, provide examples of enzymes you can use safely at different steps of the analysis. So let's take a big step back. What, you know, why does, the big picture here. DNA damage allows DNA authentication of individual species, of metagenomic assemblies, and even individual reads. It poses challenges, however, for taxonomic identification of species because it can introduce errors, accurate genome mapping, and metagenomic assembly. So we need strategies to overcome this. However, it turns out that the biggest challenge when working with ancient DNA is not the cytosine deamidation. We have a lot of ways of working with this and overcoming it. Our biggest challenge instead is fragment length, dealing with these very short pieces of DNA. And that is because it affects our ability to identify uh, DNA sequences taxonomically. DNA fragments that are less than 30 base pairs lack sufficient specificity for taxonomic assignment. They align to too many genomes with no phylogenetic currents. And this is really what sets the limits on our DNA. Um, recently, uh, Luva Dahlin's group had published this million year old mammoth DNA. There is a kind of a recent, some recent work pushing that back to perhaps 2 million years for some very deep permafrost samples. But overall, DNA work is really limited by this fragmentation step because it's not that. The limit of DNA survival is not how long a nucleotide survives. DNA nucleotides survive since the early Earth. We have nucleotides that are billions of years old. The problem is, however, once they fragment to sizes of less than 30 base pairs, we can no longer uniquely assign them to an organism, and so they lose their information. So the real limits we have on DNA uh, studies on genetic studies of the past is not on the survival of DNA itself per se. It's really based on the survival of fragments that are at least 30 base pairs long and therefore contain sufficient information to be able to assign them to taxa and to specific places in the genome. Um, we have an additional problem with with uh, bacterial DNA. If you're analyzing mammoth DNA, you can be pretty sure that your mammoth DNA is coming from somewhere within the mammoth genome, and so that limits where it could possibly go. With bacterial DNA, you potentially have tens, hundreds, or even thousands of different bacterial species, and you need to know which ones they come from. DNA sequences that are less than 100 bases long can lack taxonomic specificity within certain groups of bacteria meaning they can map equally well to close relatives. This can lead to cross-mapping within groups of related microbial taxa, making it difficult to separate them.
When there are insufficient reference genomes for a given species or a genus, these short sequences can be misassigned to the wrong strain or the wrong species. Metagenomic assembly is a relatively new technique that is really exciting, and it's one that our group has been working very hard to develop. Um, and that is where you, instead of trying to align to a reference genome, you take the actual different pieces you have uh, before you and just try to fit them together into a larger uh, reconstructed genome. One of the advantages of this is it allows you to even reconstruct things that are extinct or completely unknown or missing from present day databases. However, assembling DNA sequences that are less than 250 bases long is very challenging. It results in many short contigs or short reconstructed uh, contiguous sequences because the reads are not long enough to span repetitive elements. And many commercially available or sort of off the shelf assemblers will even automatically discard short sequences. So you always have to be sure to change the default settings. Many of them have a, a initial step that just says delete all sequences that are less than 250 bases long. So watch out for that. Um, we've recently published a paper with some recommendations about settings you can use, and Alexander Hubner, who you'll hear about later in the course, has been, is currently developing protocols for improving de novo assembly of ancient samples. But these metagenome assembled genomes, or MAGs, are possible, but they require pipelines that are fine-tuned for ancient DNA. Gone are the days of radiographic films and rulers for DNA sequencing, and now we have machines capable of churning out sequences at a time. This means that archaeogeneticists today must learn coding and scripting. And genomes are big, but they fragment for millions of pieces once the organism dies. The shortness of DNA frags with base pairs with a max of about 150 base pairs makes taxonomic genome mapping and metagenome assembly hard. Ancient DNA accumulates damage, and we can characterize fragmentation and cytosine deamination as indicators of authenticity, but not of a precise age. Ancient DNA requires specialized laboratory and library protocols in order to handle DNA damage. We now have options to remove DNA damage with UDG, or we re can recover even more damage with single-stranded library protocols, depending on the application. DNA fragmentation is our biggest challenge in ancient metagenomics. All right, and with that, I'll stop and open it up for questions. And if you want to learn more, I have a bibliography also available on my, uh, that'll be available on the slides.